Just a, a quick gentle reminder for you also, don't take anything that's said on this program as professional medical or legal advice, please. That's not why we're here. We're here to educate you and entertain you. I want to now move into our special guest today. Her name is Ellen Lee Scanlon. Um, Ellen is the co-creator of How to Do the Pot. That's an audio-first education platform for woman, women. Sorry. She's the host of the How to Do the Pot podcast, a weekly show that answers all the questions women secretly Google about cannabis. That was my favorite part of our conversation, that women secretly Google things about cannabis, and I can't wait to talk about that. The cannabis industry has long been uh, male-led, which uh, overlooked the needs of women, the fastest-growing consumer segment. And How to Do the Pot, which happens to be on, I think, episode 76 now, shares some of the best stories in cannabis. It aims to change the hearts and minds and helps women feel more confident in their choices. Ellen comes to cannabis with experience in finance, healthcare, and startups in general. She holds an MBA from the University of Virginia's Darden Graduate School of Business and a BA in English Lit from UVA. She's calling in today from San Francisco, hello, left coast, California, where she currently lives with her husband and son, Ellen, a big warm welcome to Understanding CBD. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Great. Yeah, it's a great voice. It's weird. It's you know when I listen to your podcast and then see you talk, it's kind of weird. Do you ever get that? People say uh, you know when you actually put the face to the voice. Yeah. Well, it's going to be really exciting now that we're reopening with COVID. I'm actually going to get to see some faces, so I can't wait for that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you haven't always been a West Coast girl, though, right? Have you? I have not. No, I was actually born um, at Georgetown Hospital, Hospital in Washington D.C. I lived in Alexandria, Virginia when I was a girl. I moved to Connecticut and then back to Bethesda for high school. Um, so my parents still live in Bethesda. I grew up every summer spending a lot of time in Bethany Beach, and I'm heading there in August. I can't wait. Wow, that's local. And you, we were talking about Bethany Beach. You have a favorite pizza place down there, don't you? I do. I am dying for some grotto pizza. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, a lot of questions now, since you haven't been living in Maryland for a while, um, do you eat crab cakes anywhere else, or is it like uh, you only like them when they're local in Maryland? I really don't. I mean, yeah, I, there are just some things I think I've learned. When I first, I lived in, in San Francisco since 2009, and when I first got here, I would try every fried chicken and every, you know, sort of southern food that I missed, and I've just kind of stopped. Yeah. <laughs> I just get it when I go home. There's amazing, amazing food in San Francisco, but some of the the things that have such a sort of heart and mind connection for me are just better to eat in the place where they're yeah. where they originated. Well, yeah. that makes sense. And hey, look, you know, Royal Farms fried chicken is only from Royal Farms. Right? And, and, and gotta... Old Bay is big around here. I don't think you have Old Bay on your side of the the world there or the continent. You see it every once in a while. I've actually, you know, I have to confess, I've never been a huge fan. My dad adores those potato chips, so they have been in my in my family's kitchen for many years, but um, no, I was more of a fried chicken and uh, grotto pizza kind of person. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right, well, let's let's move in. We can talk about this all day, all day long, but let's move in a little bit to our, our main topic so our audience doesn't get bored with us. Um, uh, the, the first I wanted to start with is if you could share with us your story, really, of, um, you know, why did you launch uh, How to Do the Pot? Sure. Well, you know, I think it's important to remember, first of all, that women make 80% of purchasing decisions. And when you think about that and what that means for all industries, it's very interesting. And you can see a lot of industries that are more focused on women. Cannabis has historically really been focused on the male consumer. And so when we were trying to figure out sort of how to find our place in cannabis, I think that we thought of a, a modern way to reach women in a, a way that could engender trust. And as you know from being on the radio, you know, you can hear in someone's voice when they are trying to help you out. And that's really, I think, what the, the main focus of how to do the pot is. We're trying to demystify cannabis for women. Um, you know, I worked in investments. I worked in women's health care startups and, and just started to realize that women are really an underserved uh, demographic and teaching them how to understand cannabis. You know, in, in November, every state that had cannabis on the ballot passed it. Since January of 2021, five states have legalized. Over 80 million women have legal access to cannabis now. And I would venture to say a lot of them really don't know what to do next. And so 
we are trying to be that trusted voice that they can listen to. And, you know, I think about weed all the time, but if women think about it once a week for, you know, the 20 or 30 minutes that they listen to my show, I want them to walk away feeling more confident, more clear, able to kind of take that next step whenever they are ready. And why is it important to demystify, you know, medical cannabis, marijuana in, in medical circles, in societal circles? Why do you feel that's important? Well, I think that, first of all, it's a plant. <laughs> you know, it's showing a lot of promise for a lot, a, a huge variety of medical conditions. Cannabis has been medically legal in California since 1996. It was the first state. And it really came about with the AIDS crisis. And um, the support and help that so many patients were getting. And so I think, number one, it can really provide major, major medical benefits. There are also 40,000 people still in prison for cannabis crimes, so that has to change. And I think that the, the drug war and the propaganda that many people understand, the fear that many people have around cannabis, um, is very real. You know, I, I had fear coming into this. I've lived in a legal state for a long time, and, and I think that if any of your listeners have spent time in legal states, um, fully legal, adult use legal, medical legal, I think is still, um, it, it doesn't feel the same as when it is adult use legal, but it, it's a plant. And I really want people to understand that uh, what they may have thought about cannabis might not be true. And, um, and so I think that that is an incredibly important but very complex kind of esoteric idea that we're trying to come to with really practical advice. Yeah, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good mission, and it's definitely needed. Obviously, we're on the same page uh, as you are, which is why we do the show. And I have very strong opinions about the use of, of cannabis. Uh, I'm on the mindset that all use of cannabis or marijuana, CBD, is medical. Um, well, you can call it recreational, what you want, but people self-medicate. Um, it's, it's really, uh, in my mind, it's all medical use. Um, but what you, I'm curious, where do you see the link between women's health and, um, and cannabis? I absolutely agree with you that everyone is coming to cannabis for some type of a medical benefit. Um, you know, a hug can have a medical benefit sometimes, as we all know, especially yeah. if you were feeling isolated from COVID. So I think people are understanding that a medical benefit is something that may be broader than, than where they initially um, thought about it. But the, the problem with health and cannabis is that it's still a Schedule One drug. And so there are just not a lot of studies. Um, but women's health, which is my focus, is also an extremely understudied area. So there was a study that came out in 2020 from the University of Chicago and UC Berkeley that women are widely over-medicated. And what that means is that they're suffering extremely excess side effects because drug dosages are calculated based on studies done on male subjects. And so this is just one area of women's health that is underneath broader health, that is underneath cannabis, that really needs to be studied. And I think it actually has a lot to do with the, way, the reasons that women come to cannabis, because women really are suffering so many more side effects from common drugs, and it's affecting their life. And many, I mean, the stories that I hear are, you can't help but have compassion for some of these stories. And so I think that that is a real link and women are coming to cannabis for similar relief often from the prescription drugs that they're getting, but so many fewer side effects. We have a lot of people coming back and forth um, and asking questions. Most are afraid to uh, get near the booth because, you know, we, they feel like they're just going to get high or something just by walking through. Osmosis. Yeah, just by osmosis. They're going to absorb it. And um, But we do notice that women do come up with, um, with more questions than men do. And most of the questions that they ask us just generally is like, what is this going to do for me? And um, we get some general questions, but... And what we want to know is really those, the, the things that you alluded to earlier. What are the questions that women secretly Google about cannabis? It's, you know, what, what, what do we need to tell them? What do we need to get out here? The secretly Googled question. <laughs> <laughs> Stress, sleep, and sex are the top things that women want to know about, followed closely by chronic pain. And that chronic pain can be related to um, autoimmune diseases, which dispropor disproportionately affect women. It can be related to other disorders like migraines, endometriosis. Um, so we get definitely health questions, but 
stress and sleep, I think, especially during COVID, uh, were a lot of questions that I was getting personal texts from friends and uh, and friends and uh, sort of the second layer of people who are like, my mom's asking, my cousin's asking. Um, and, you know, your discreet friend Google can definitely help you out there. Um, and it is hopefully then guiding you to the podcast where you can hear our short episodes that answer those questions uh, really simply and try to just provide uh, expert advice and stories so that you can hear how other women are consuming cannabis and bringing it into their life. Now, do you encourage the women that reach out to uh, reach out to their medical professional and talk to them about things like cannabis? Is that something that you encourage them to do? So this is actually kind of a tough question um, because I think it's really important to consider where you live and the relationship that you have with your physician. Um, so doctors, I really do believe, are starting to realize that patients just want to know about cannabis. Um, and I think that hopefully that is driving. I know University of Maryland now has a program uh, about cannabis. A lot more universities are bringing it in. And I think that it can really depend on your doctor. Um, if you already know that cannabis works for you and you want to find a doctor that can help you to hone in on what specifically to use for you know, that monthly migraine that you have, or in my case, I have endometriosis, there are, I think you have Dr. G. It sounds like he's a wonderful cannabis doctor. I speak to Dr. Jun Shin, who's based in New York. There are some doctors on the West Coast um, at the American Cannabinoid Clinics. And so I, I definitely recommend speaking to them about specifics. Um, women's pain is routinely not believed by physicians, which is sad and maddening. And so the advice that I really give is if you're not getting what you want from your doctor, be willing to change. Get a second opinion. Uh, keep talking to people. Um, but but I think that the sad thing that I have to say is that, yes, it could, it could harm a relationship with a physician that you have really gotten some help from. But if, if you're not getting what you need, keep looking. Well, and that's the thing. Like, when people start looking for cannabis as a solution, is there, like, any sort of common reason that I mean, I know the general people are struggling with and what it can help with, but are there you know any like a number one reason why people are actually looking specifically for cannabis versus another type of product? You know, the stories that I hear really are mostly from women who have tried everything and as a last resort, try cannabis, and it's the first thing that works for them. And you know, I spoke to a woman who had Crohn's disease who, had been was on 14 medications doing every single thing her doctor said and she got to a point where her brain was completely foggy her body was breaking down she really thought that she was not going to live much longer and so she said listen i just started partying a little bit i started smoking weed with friends and i would come home and feel so much better and slowly but surely she started to realize that it was actually the cannabis that was helping and so I, I, I wish and I hope that as more states legalize, more women will not have to reach these terrible points where they feel like they don't have any any hope left. But that is unfortunately where a lot of women, I think, um, just sort of throw their hands up and say, I surrender, I'll try anything, and they try cannabis. And it sounds like you hear a lot of stories. Are there any conditions that absolutely surprised you or, you know, threw you for a loop? Well, so endometriosis is a condition that I have. It affects one in 10 women. It takes an average of 10 years to be diagnosed. It is uh, extremely painful. It has a wide variety of symptoms. Uh, physicians will tell you it's the cause of between 50 and 60% of unexplained infertility in women who are trying to have a baby, which, you know, as male or female listeners, if, you are, uh, if you've experienced infertility, it is a terrible, terrible time in, in many people's lives. And endometriosis is um, I take CBD and I don't even need THC it's a miracle for me it is so helpful with the pain and really supports me but I think that what a lot of women find and and my personal experience is as well when you have a tool that you know works it just like your shoulders can drop a little bit you, your stress level around your condition can come down when you know that there's something that will work for you that won't you know, put you to bed for three days or make you feel like you don't even know what planet you're on or some of the things that some of these painkillers um, cause. Um, so I think that 
the surprise of the subtlety of the side effects and the subtlety of the effects with the relief that you get is, I think, the biggest surprise that women that I speak to and, and that I personally experienced as well. Yeah, and it's valuable. I mean, your perspective is valuable. Obviously, you're not coming on here as a doctor or physician, um, but you have an ear to the ground, uh, and that's really important a voice to bring out. And it's, it's, it's not a medical recommendation from a specific training. It's through experience and, and, and really having your ear to the ground of, of what is relevant. And that really brings a lot of value to people because they know it's, it's something that's interesting. And hopefully, you know, it's our goal to get people to go to cannabis first instead of last, you know. And if it doesn't work, you know, then, of course, you have a whole litany of things that you can, um, you can try. And, you know, one of the common things that we hear also um, uh, from women are migraines in migraine pain and um, do you have any any sort of like word on the street about migraines or are women using um, you know CBD a lot for migraines or do you see it more uh, you know how do you see the usage around is really my question <laughs> around migraines sure. well um, I, I just did an episode on migraines uh, we have a, a newsletter that comes out twice a month and I did a newsletter on migraines because we were getting so many search queries into our website uh, about migraines. So they affect nearly 40 million Americans, but women are three times more likely than men to experience migraines. And I had a um, Dr. June Chin, who's a physician, and Sandra Gwines, who's a nurse, both on the show. And we told a story of a woman who had been experiencing, experiencing migraines since she was a child. She had a traumatic event in her childhood, which caused like the ventricle in her brain to expand and her doctor told her to drink a can of coke a day when she was like 11 years old and um so she discovered cannabis when she was in graduate school after many years of suffering kind of in the same way as my Crohn's disease story you know she was just she was drinking a lot of wine to go to sleep and kind of started to realize this wasn't the right move for her in her 20s and so she started cannabis and it was amazing for her migraines what I would say about migraines, and, and please listen to the episode because we have a, a lot of experts who can explain the, the intricacies of it, but some women get relief from CBD and some get relief from THC. I think in general, CBD helps uh, almost as a supplement where if you're taking it regularly, you can lower the inflammation. For acute pain with migraines, what women that I speak to and the doctors I speak to found is that having THC, high levels of THC strains maybe like a strain like Granddaddy Perp, which can help you go to sleep. If you can go to sleep with a migraine and sleep for six or seven hours and then wake up and not have it, that can save you like three days of pain. And so that's really how I have, um, have been hearing that women have been using it. But the CBD THC mix is going to be very dependent on you. And, um, and so I, um, doctor <laughs> yeah and one of the hardest things is making people understand that they can make that tr transition uh, uh, supposedly from prescriptions over to cannabis so it, we were listening to one of your podcasts and a get was a guest was talking uh, through her journey to reduce her prescriptions and the question is how do you know when to substitute cannabis for a prescription potentially well what the experts that I speak to say is there, is, there really is good data that cannabis helps with pain and with sleep. And while the data may be coming from Israel or outside of the U.S., there are studies that show that. And so these doctors recommend starting with those type of medications rather than the medications that are specifically geared towards whatever your condition might be. So if you're taking seven drugs, but two of them are for sleep and one of them is for pain, if you can minimize those drugs, you can kind of loosen up your body and and limit some of the side effects. Um, and so that's really the, the advice that we got. And, you know, it is a really hard thing. On every episode, I feel like I have to say, listen, you're going to have to experiment. And it's hard to say it. I wish I didn't. I can't wait for a time when I don't have to say it. Um, but that really is where we are with cannabis right now. Um, the one tip that I've gotten from several doctors is if you are going to consume cannabis with your prescription medications, wait two hours. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're consuming it and it's going through your liver, which is how a lot of uh, cannabis, if you're eating it or um, 
it, I don't want to get into the science because I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but wait two hours between your prescriptions, and I, that stuck with me. <laughs> yeah, that's it's the same thing that comes out often when we talk to them, yeah. whether it's a pharmacist or, or a doctor, is just to give it that two hours to make sure there's no conflict in the liver for processing, and that's a good rule in general for sure to stick with. Um, you do an interesting segment also on your podcast about – um, the first time women bought legal weed. And I think it's a really interesting perspective because you're not asking what's the first time you tried it because people are then thinking back to some other time in their childhood. But you're saying, look, in the recent days, like, you know, what was your experience? Can you tell us a little about why you started doing that and maybe some of the stories? Sure. It's a really fun series. And it started because I was thinking back to the first time I bought legal weed, um, and I needed a friend to come with me. I had a friend who had been uh, consuming for longer than me, and she took me around, and we went to probably three or four different dispensaries in San Francisco, and I got to walk in with a friend and go through the process of showing your ID and walking in and seeing all the products and speaking to a bud tender, and um, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And so I just thought that if I could provide a similar experience for women all across the country who have really different experiences, it could just be that um, that little spark that helps you, if you don't have a friend like I did, you know, maybe you have a friend in your mind or there's a story that you can relate to. So we have amazing stories from women from all across the country. Um, some of them have traveled to legal states, so a lot of the stories take place in Colorado or California, um, which have been legal markets for a while. Um, but, you know, some are funny. There was a woman from Wisconsin who came to California who was hanging out with her friends who stood in front of a dispensary and saw that uh, there was a security guard and was just standing there having fun. She's like, I was just so happy to be in California and outside of the winter in Wisconsin. And she thought that she, I can't remember if it was push or pull, but whatever she did didn't open the door. A line starts forming behind her. Everybody's asking, what's going on? What's going on? She's like, I don't know. And then suddenly someone from inside the dispensary came out and realized that they were all just waiting there because she hadn't done the door oh, correctly. Um, so, you know, funny stories like that. Um, and then we have stories of medical patients who, um, you know, had been, consuming through um, either illegal sources or finding a medical source and then being told, you know, you you have a real reason to go and do this. You can go into a store and buy it. And, and just this moment of, wow, I can do this. This is my medicine and I can get it and I can get help with it. So they're wonderful stories. Um, my personal story was going to Colorado on vacation and I felt like I had, um, I walked into like a fancy New York City apothecary. I couldn't believe it. So they're all really fun and, and different. And, and as more women um, step into these stores uh, across the country, send us your story. We'd love to put you on the air. That's yeah. great. And, you know, we appreciate you being on the show today. We're out of time uh, for the conversation as we never get to all the things we want to ask you. But I urge everyone to go follow up with, um, with Ellen. Ellen, how do the people get to you and your podcast? How to Do the Pot is available wherever you listen to podcasts. And for lots more information about women in cannabis, you can go to dothepot.com, which is our website. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ellen.